I was traveling to the U.S. at the time and uh, with a couple of my friends and <clears throat> I had just arrived in the U.S. Um, in Florida and uh, we were going for a fishing trip actually or planning a fishing trip, we never did. And um, it was the only time that I would miss the 6th of October parade, which was an annual event um, celebrating the October victory. So um, with the time difference, uh, I woke up that morning. It was um, in the afternoon here in Egypt. And I received the call saying there has been some shooting and uh, that my father was hurt. The, the person who informed me was the head of the resort we were staying in, in, in Florida. So I immediately uh, tried to call Cairo and um, I couldn't reach anyone immediately at the time. And then I opened the news and then on the news it said that he was hurt in his arm, but he was okay. I still continued to try to call until I reached my mother, and she was at the hospital at that time in Mahadi with him. And she informed me right away, right then, that um, my father had passed away. So I received the call by the prime minister at the time, uh, Dr. Fuad Mohiddin, and he told me that I uh, would like to make an autopsy because uh, there is a bullet that's uh, located in uh, somewhere and we just need to verify because there is a theory that some of his, one or some of his bodyguards may have assassinated him. So the following day, uh, I told my mother, I'm going to do so and so. And she said, I will be with you. So actually both of us got in, into a car and we went to Maadi hospital where this autopsy was supposed to be performed. We were met by the uh, head of that hospital. It's a military hospital. And he said, well, I cannot permit you to uh, attend the autopsy. So I said, well, um, I insist. I will not allow anybody to touch my father without me being next to him. And the bullet was uh, residing in, in the neck area. So um, you heard a lot of stories about the assassination. In reality, uh, this bullet was uh, uh, when, when the shooting started, my father stood up and uh, people were shooting from the truck that was in the parade that stopped in front of him and, and other people went down running towards him. Um, all the bullets that were shot, he, he was only injured in one arm and in, in one thigh. So these were not really uh, fatal at all. These were nothing. The bullet that uh, really uh, was fatal was the bullet that was shot from the truck, not from the people who came all the way to the stand where he is, where he was, um, and that made a, a bounce, a ricochet on the on the counter that was in front of him, and so it went upward with an angle. So it entered in the chest and went through the heart and lodged and situated here in the neck. And this was the fatal bullet. Uh, time was of the essence for the tanks, for the planes, for all that. And, and uh, the Shah of Iran was not a friend of my father. The Shah of Iran had uh, a big uh, container, a big uh, tanker ships going to Europe with fuel. And my father was in dire need of fuel at the time. And with just a phone call between him and Shah, and they were not friends, I repeat that. At the time, they were not friends. But the Shah stood by Egypt and redirected those tankers to Egypt to unload, to save the day, if you will. And my father, I'm talking here about the principles, 
my father, when the Shah was deposed or when he left by his own free will Iran during the revolution that, that happened there, uh, he, he, was, he, was, uh, he, he was the Shah of the Shah, the Shah in Shah, means the king of kings. And before he left, he, when he was going to the States or in any uh, official trips, the presidents and, and kings of Europe would uh, race to, to, to try to have his plane refuel at one of their airports. So the head of state there would go and uh, have a photo op with him uh, on his way to the States. Uh, at that time, it was President Destin or, or Margaret Thatcher or those were at the time of the Shah. When he left Iran, no one of these countries would even take him or consider or offer. And, and this was very disappointing because when he was at the top of the power, all those countries were again racing for a photo up or to show up with him in the airport while he's refueling on his way to the States. Uh, even the States would not take him. So my father, when he invited him to come and stay in Egypt, he did it not because they were friends, he was returning the favor that the Shah did for Egypt against a lot of criticism from his own people, against a lot of criticism from other countries as well, including Iran itself, which made us an enemy from that day until today. My father did not want to make an enemy of anyone or did not want to hurt anyone's feelings, but he could not deny that this man stood by Egypt, not by my father, but by Egypt in its time of need. That's what I refer to as his principles that he lived by. Before going to Jerusalem, he went to Syria to President Assad and met him and asked him to join him. And President Assad was a dear friend to my father, I can tell you that. And he told him, no, I will not come with you. So my father asked him and said, please, I ask you to give me your permission to speak on your behalf. If I fail, it will be me who failed. If I succeed, then we will both succeed. And he told him, no, I will not give you permission to do that as well. So my father left very unhappy because it was an offer that would, had no downside for, for Syria at the time. And my father believed that the military might finished uh, its role. There is no way we're going to go any further with the military. It had to be uh, uh, political. It had to be with diplomacy. And he realized that the United States had the major role to play on, on, on this end because uh, the United States, until this date, is the main supporter of Israel, from uh, military to, to everything. And, and all the, 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 the lobby they have, uh, Israel has, and rightfully so. I mean, uh, my father understood this. So he had no other choice. He had whether to be uh, uh, a man of uh, looking for his own fame and, and keep saying, I will throw them in the sea and get the support of, of all the countries and uh, really do nothing at the end because nobody's going to throw them in the sea because they're guaranteed safety by the US and the Soviet Union. At the time, there was no way but peace. There was no other way but peace again. The two superpowers guaranteed the safety of Israel, have always and still do until today. Now, uh, uh, he had hoped, as I said, that the Arab countries would join him uh, in his, uh, you know, uh, in their uh, road for peace. It did not happen. Um, everything has its time, really. And, and history will, will only show. During the Arab boycott, it was not something that he liked or, or would, have ho would have hoped for. It was something that he was very sad about, but 
it did not sway him from his goal because he knew that he will not be able to fight a war anymore, uh, that he will not be throwing Israel into the sea, and that this is a new world. Uh, diplomacy has to prevail. And uh, he could foresee that this is coming. Now, 40 years later, I, I have to tell you, uh, his vision was not that off. Uh, it was uh, accurate in, in a great extent. And, uh, and other Arab countries that were against are now having uh, solid uh, relations with Israel, even stronger than Egypt has today, without mentioning uh, names. But I mean, at the end of the day, wars are not a good thing. Where will wars take you? I mean, at the end, uh, you will have to sit down and talk as human beings and, and solve your problems. Uh, my father had, when he came to office to, to be president after Gamal Abdel Nasser, he actually made several proposals for peace, uh, but they were never met with any seriousness. Um, and um, they were completely um, just uh, disregarded. Uh, and he came to understand that um, he was facing the ultimate um, decision that the world will only uh, listen to power or to um, strong people standing on solid grounds. And that there was no way to handle or deal with the stagnation and the situation of the Arab-Israeli conflict without um, making a move. And in, in that case, it was uh, the October war. This war, in short, demonstrated that Egypt will not stand still uh, with uh, Israel occupying uh, Sinai and other Arab territory. And so my father, uh, um, realized after a few years that the whole thing will go to forgetfulness, if you will, and people will forget, you know, and it will stay the status quo. And so he made this initiative in the Egyptian parliament that he is ready to go to the end of the world to speak to the Knesset itself if it would spare uh, uh, you know, shedding any more blood of uh, Egyptian uh, young men. Uh, there was one thing, the Israelis crossed to the western side of the Suez Canal. Yes, they, they are masters of media and they projected this as uh, their own victory in the October war. It is not true and I will tell you why. Um, the, the Israelis managed to uh, cross uh, between the second army and the third army in a place called the Difres War, helped by the uh, US intelligence, which was the SR-71A, the high-flying uh, spy, uh, spy planes that were able to identify this weak spot between the two armies. And they were able to deliver to Israel at the time very high uh, tech weapons uh, that were uh, deployed by their aircraft that actually destroyed uh, uh, multiple uh, air defense uh, SAM sites, which gave them uh, an open corridor for their uh, warplanes to cover this um, crossing the Suez Canal to the western side. However, to make a, a, a summary of this, really, Yes, they crossed to the western side, but, uh, and they tried to take Suez. They could not take Suez, which is a civilian uh, uh, town, city, and uh, they could not go any further west. The Egyptian reserve uh, blocked the west. The second army and the third army um, um, joined. So in essence, really, they were in the middle of uh, they were trapped in the middle of Egyptian forces here. Now, very frankly, the Egyptians were doing, uh, uh, Egyptian uh, special forces were doing nightly raids uh, and really causing a lot of uh, 
casualties to the Israeli side. And um, at one point, uh, my father uh, announced that he could destroy the, um, this pocket, if you will. We called it the pocket. And Henry Kissinger uh, uh, gave an ultimatum. And he said uh, the United States would not permit the Russian uh, arms and the Russian equipment to defy once again uh, uh, American equipment. You cross the Suez Canal, you made your point, you crossed the Barlev line, you destroyed the Barlev line, we will not allow you to kill or destroy uh, the Israelis in the pocket. Anwar Sadat was a very uh, down-to-earth person. He was a very um, simple person. He um, he was a very kind person. He lived a hard life and understood uh, what is it to be poor and um, appreciated life and understood that, you know, uh, there is lots of things to life other than um, riches or, or money or things. He, he understood um, to love the land with all his might. He, he, he loved his country, he loved uh, uh, the land, and uh, he, he tried to instill this in us. And, and he had a lot of uh, things since I was a young man, since I was a kid, that he always uh, tried to teach us, and uh, me and my sisters, and, and, and uh, make us you know, uh, grow with. I recall many incidents in Alexandria, he, they would say he would pray in the mosque that was in the uh, Naval Academy mosque and uh, going on the way then he would see a very small, uh, not even mosque, we call it a zawiya, a small uh, area for prayers for the poorer people and he would stop the car and take me and go down and we pray the Friday prayers with uh, these farmers and uh, it was a normal thing. I mean, he was, he loved being with the people. He loved uh, uh, being within the crowd and shaking hands and touching the people, you know. Johannes Sadat was uh, um, really uh, a strong lady, um, a kind lady, and um, a very loving person for her family. After my father passed away, she would not um, sit back and, and stay at home and uh, you know she, she continued her career, she, she got her PhD in Arabic literature, she traveled to the United States, she started teaching as a visiting professor and uh, she was uh, um, teaching uh, uh, women in the Middle East, she was not teaching something different, she was still preaching and teaching about uh, women in our part of the world and uh, she was uh, uh, doing uh, also uh, lectures and events and all were directed towards whether promoting women's rights uh, and or uh, uh, the, the peace in the Middle East and continuing the path and promoting peace in the Middle East. And she kept doing so until very recent years, uh, when she decided to uh, move back to Egypt and, and continue with her family. She was diagnosed with cancer, uh, and it was, had spread really in many parts of the body, so it was stage four. These things, uh, you can only prolong, uh, you know, but when the time comes, it comes, you know. And she also believed that, and she had no uh, misunderstanding about that. Um, she just uh, asked us and said, well, um, I have one request only, if I could be buried next, in the area next to your father. Of course, she cannot be physically next to him, it's not in our religion, you know, but in, she meant in the area next to him. So my mother said to me, please ask the president, she loved President Sisi, by the way, and she's a great believer in President Sisi and was to the last breath 
a great believer in, in President Sisi, the savior of Egypt. That was he is. And we all believe that. So she told me, ask him if I can be buried next to your father, I mean, in the area next to your father, fine. If not, which I fully understand when her uh, condition became really worse, I called the president on the phone. And uh, the, his office said, what's it about, you know, the, I told him, no, it's a personal matter. I will only speak it to him. So they connected me to the president and I told him, Mr. President, I have one last wish from my mother. And she asked to, buried, to be buried uh, in the area next to my father, my father, if it were possible. If it were not, she fully understands and she still loves you. And that was real because this is what she told us, showed me and my sisters. And he very gracefully and always in this calm, um, warm, calm, assuring voice. Kamal, uh, I will call you back. Give me some time to look into this matter. So I uh, woke up in the morning. I opened my mobile. I found many missed calls from the presidency. I said, my goodness, very late, like 12 midnight and after 12 midnight. And then as I was thinking, the phone, my mobile rang again. So I answered, he said, uh, so and so, I said, yes, it's me speaking. Okay, uh, the president is on the line. And they switch me on to President Sisi. And he said, the Gamal, I, I tried calling you yesterday. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. President, I was for two days, I haven't been sleeping well, so I really crashed yesterday. <laughs> he said, well, I, I had discussed it with the uh, military uh, um, engineering corps and uh, everything is prepared and set and i i was right like honestly uh, um, shaken and uh, unable to speak clearly from the appreciation and the the how to say the word the it it the the affection the the it was very moving i said mr president i'm indebted to you for the rest of my life i thank you and my sister noah calls me and said uh, gamal uh, she passed away i'll be so i called the president again and i said mr president uh, he knew of course that she passed away from the hospital so he told me, يعني, uh, so I said, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my sisters and I are hopefully requesting that we bear her as quick as possible. So he answers again in his very uh, calm and assuring and comforting voice. I will do what you request. However, would you permit me uh, to do something that's befitting for Jihan Sadat, wife of Anwar Sadat. I said, Mr. President, I can only uh, accept whatever you say. Uh, they sent us an, an escort. Uh, um, we prayed for, uh, we prayed uh, prayers uh, in the hospital mosque. And then we went to the burial site, which is the, the, Right next to my father, they did like an, a, a mirror image from the tombstone of my father is here. Uh, and it's written, he lived for peace and died for principles in Arabic. And on the other side, the inscriptions for Jihan Sadat. And to our surprise, we found a, a military uh, a funeral that's befitting to, to presidents, uh, you know. And it was the first time in Egypt that something like this happens. And I have to really stop here for a second to mention something. That um, only strong people who are strong in personality and who are strong within themselves and believe in God do these um, uncommon 
strong uh, things. Moreover, he gave her Wasam uh, al-Kamal, which is the highest award given to women in Egypt. We didn't even know about Wasam al-Kamal. It was from the days of the king and before the king, uh, only given a few times in history. He revived this and he gave her, and it's in four categories, he gave her the highest category, Wasam al-Kamal, and it was uh, presented ahead of her in the funeral. I mean, he did things that uh, nobody expected and this is what makes me see the resemblance between him and my father I'm not saying he's my father because he's a different person but they have a lot of things in common believing in God believing in themselves strong people and doing what's right in their own judgment